In this lesson, we'll try to understand how amoeba move in an adaptive way. This giant blob here you see on the screen here is a single-celled organism called amoeba. And it's clearly moving. You can see the cell membrane here. And then a whole bunch of cytoplasm here seems to be on the move. And it seems to crawl around by extending portions of its membrane called pseudopods. Now, amoeba live in watery environments, and they like to feed on other single-celled creatures called paramecia. This is a paramecium that is now trapped in what we call a food vacuole. So the amoeba here apparently has eaten one over here. Here's another dead paramecium, another one here, here. This one is still alive, and it's currently being digested. But in 10 minutes or so, it will die. And the whole point of this process, of course, is to turn the paramecium into a bundle of nutrients that the amoeba will use to make amoeba parts. So our question for this uh, lesson will be, how does amoeba move in an adaptive way? It doesn't have a brain, but how is it that it can seem to pursue its prey? So for example, in this scene here, here we see two paramecia, and the pseudopods appear to be moving in a way so as to surround the paramecium. This is clearly adaptive behavior. But this single-celled amoeba doesn't have a brain, so how is it that it seems to be moving in an intelligent way to capture its prey? That's what we'll try to understand in this lesson. Okay, so the question we're going to ask is, how does amoeba detect and move towards prey? So here we see an amoeba, here we see some prey, the paramecium. And in time, what's going to happen is the, the amoeba is going to surround its prey, forming a food vacuole. And the answer we're going to provide here involves three proteins. A protein called a microtubule, and then we're going to call another protein a chopper, and then these little proteins on the cell membrane, we're going to call them receptor proteins. First, the microtubules. Microtubules are rod-like proteins composed of subunits that can stick together to form a longer rod-like protein. So here we see a picture of these little golf ball looking things here and the idea is each of these subunits is a protein but their chemical nature allows them to stick together and they will do so spontaneously so that if, if each of these subunits is floating around in the cytoplasm and they bump into another microtubule that is already kind of forming this uh, rod here, uh, it will stick. Well, when subunits bump into an already formed microtubule, the microtubule gets longer. So we want to think of microtubules then as a kind of internal structural protein. It's like an internal skeleton of a cell. And the microtubule proteins then determine the shape of the overall cell. Now here's an amoeba on the left. On the right we see some human cells. They've been specially treated to reveal the internal proteins that provide the sort of uh, skeleton, you might say, of the cell. And it gives uh, structure and shape to the cell. Uh, but for the amoeba then, evidently these microtubules, if they, if they um, govern the shape of the cell, they must be changing because the amoeba's shape is constantly changing. So we'll have to understand how it is that microtubules can change their length if we're going to understand how an amoeba can change its shape. Now, on the left here is an amoeba here, and notice the blue lines here are going to represent microtubules. They seem to be radiating out like spokes on a wheel. And biologists think that there is a kind of an organizing center for these microtubules, and the microtubules radiate out, uh, giving shape to the overall cell. Now, we've already seen that the microtubule subunits can spontaneously uh, connect together to make longer microtubules. But if the amoeba's shape is changing, there must be a way for the microtubules to be shortened. And here, then, is, uh, is the role for our second protein, what we're going to call chopper. Choppers are floating around in the cytoplasm of the cell, and what they can do is chop off the last unit of the microtubule protein. And this uh, chopping occurs at the tips of the microtubule, not down at the sort of uh, origin or the, uh, 
the organizing center, but at the very tips. So choppers can bump around, and if they happen to bump into the end of the microtubule, they can chop off the last subunit. And so with these two proteins, the microtubules that spontaneously can form longer structures and choppers, which can shorten the microtubules, then we have two proteins then that seem to be involved in changing the shape of an amoeba. In this picture down here on the left here, then here's our organizing center for microtubules. And here we see our microtubules kind of radiating out. And each of them has a sort of a characteristic length. Over time, the lengths of those microtubules will be changing as a result of two processes. The spontaneous, the spontaneous assembly of microtubule units, and that'll make the microtubule get longer. And then the action of the choppers will tend to shorten them. And so, so far as we know now, there's just sort of these two competing processes that are going to generate changes in the overall shape of the amoeba as these proteins interact. So for example, if we take microtubule labeled A here and B, microtubule A is long over here, but in time, it's a little shorter. So evidently, some choppers were chopping away at the tips of the microtubule, but B got longer. Evidently. A spontaneous assembly here happened here, and uh, no choppers were uh, evidently uh, uh, around or just happened to bump into the end of the uh, microtubule, so microtubule B could get longer as a result of the spontaneous stickiness and assembly of the microtubules. Now, if amoeba only had these two proteins, the microtubules and the choppers, then we could only really understand how amoeba can change its shape but the shape changes would be just sort of random, as the choppers and the microtubules just sort of randomly bumped around in the cytoplasm, the shape of the amoeba would randomly change. But that's not what we see under the microscope. We see amoeba pursuing prey, and that's not a random change in shape. That, that is more like a goal-directed change in shape as it pursues prey and captures prey. So there's something missing in our story, because if it's just microtubules and choppers, we would expect that the amoeba would just, over time, change its shape in a random fashion. But they don't. They pursue and capture prey. So in this diagram, we see our microtubules, and we see some choppers. And now we're ready to consider the function of the third protein, the membrane receptor proteins, these little Ys on the cell membrane. Now you'll notice the, uh, we have a little a paramecium out here. This would be the prey. Now imagine, and what we're trying to understand here is how it is that the amoeba is going to move towards the prey. Well, if microtubules got longer in this part of the amoeba, that would move the pseudopod towards the prey. Well, how would microtubules get longer when there are choppers around in the cytoplasm? Well, perhaps somehow the choppers could be stopped. They, maybe they could be blocked in this part of the amoeba. But the choppers would not be blocked in other places in the amoeba. Uh, so if, if that's the case, then maybe the amoeba could move in this direction uh, towards the food if somehow it could block the choppers in this part of the amoeba. Well, here's where the receptor proteins might come into play. After all, the ones over here in this part of the amoeba are positioned nearest to the, to the prey. What if they could detect some kind of chemical from the prey, and in detecting that chemical, could block the choppers? And notice then that chemical will be detected by these receptors, but perhaps not detected as much by the receptors over on this end of the amoeba. And so while choppers might be stopped over here, allowing microtubules to grow in that direction, the choppers would not be stopped over here, allowing uh, the shortening of microtubules here. So the whole amoeba could then move in the direction towards the prey. So how might this work? And biologists suspect that what's going on here is that the membrane receptors, upon detecting chemicals from the prey, are releasing a second messenger protein, a kind of a, another little piece of protein. And that protein will then float around in the cytoplasm in the pseudopod here. And if it bumps into a chopper, it can bind to it and then stop the activity of the chopper. And if the chopper is stopped, then the subunits of microtubules are free to continue to stick on to the end and make the microtubule longer. And that will sort of make the pseudopod grow in the direction of the prey. 
So here we see the involvement of the critical third protein here, the membrane receptor proteins, responsible for detecting chemicals from prey, and when they detect chemicals, they block the choppers. And as a consequence, spontaneous assembly of the microtubules will grow that pseudopod out towards the prey. And that certainly is adaptive behavior. Here is another look at this scenario. We have our prey over here releasing chemicals. Uh, and we have our big pseudopod here. And we've got our microtubules here, which can spontaneously get longer. The choppers, which can chop them and make the microtubules shorter. And we've got our membrane receptor proteins. Notice this protein has detected chemical from the prey. It releases its little signal protein. Notice we're indicating here sort of a random path. This, after all, is a protein uh, bumping around in the fluid of the cytoplasm. These proteins don't have uh, intelligence, they don't have eyes, and they don't know where the choppers are, they're just bumping around. But if they happen to bump into one, they can stop their activity. And so we, uh, we get the choppers being uh, blocked, and that's a temporary blockage here. But as a result, the microtubules will grow longer uh, towards the prey. Now, we, that's important to note that that's temporary, so these things will dislodge and find their way back to the receptor proteins so that the process can happen again. Notice this protein over here is not currently detecting the chemical, so it still has its little second messenger here. So in summary, then, the interaction of three different kinds of proteins can help us understand adaptive movement in amoeba. So here we have our amoeba down here. Here we have our prey. And notice the chemicals are being detected by receptor proteins closest to the prey. The receptors are empty over here, so these microtubules can still be shortened because the choppers are still working, while these microtubules will get longer because the choppers will be blocked. And the, and the result is the amoeba will move towards its prey. So now as we watch this uh, movement of the amoeba, we can appreciate what's happening internally here. Here we see pseudopods that are being extended. We have the prey here. And the idea is, is that membrane receptor proteins, which we cannot see, they're too small in the light microscope to see them, the membrane receptor proteins are detecting the presence of uh, molecules from the prey. And they are sending their little signals to block the choppers. When the choppers are blocked, pseudopods in this, or the, uh, the microtubules in these areas of the amoeba will uh, spontaneously assemble and grow. And that makes the pseudopods get longer. So here we have the pseudopods are getting longer because the choppers are blocked here. And they grow to such an extent that they can surround the prey thus forming a food vacuole. Now in time, the chemicals detected by the receptor proteins, those chemicals will detach, and the receptor proteins will be empty again, ready to respond to new signals in the environment.